Thanks, Libby. Thanks for inviting me. Feels like home. I come every Saturday, so it's, it's nice to see familiar faces. Um, two people who brought my books have put in requests, so I'm going to read those first from the book. The first is Christine's request, and this poem is called Wick. I really love The Secret Garden. This is kind of inspired by that. If you could see my soul right at this moment, it would appear to be driftwood, as long as the hull of a ship and as twined as a Morton Bay fig tree, pearly smooth and clean as bone. But come closer, there is a track, like a furrowed groove, a beautiful scar forming the path my tears made before you came, gumbooted and tree planting. Touch the part darkened by shadow. God is etching a long poem on the underside. You'll find it steeped in song and prayer. Before you leave, I want you to know it's not driftwood at all. Turn it over and you'll see it's still wick. <laughs> and just to, just to accompany that, I thought I might um, read a couple of little ones about Tafranui because I go tree planting in Tafranui, which is up north of Auckland. And... Um, I go, try to go every July, I love it. And so I wrote a couple of poems about that. At Tough Renui, I follow the curvature of the flotsam trail, stopping occasionally to trace the braille of a kinner shell fragment. Why do brittle curiosities interest me so much? Finn's scavenger hunt is underway, but I am content, dusted by a fine powder of sand just to wander. Among nature's curios, there exists a fragile kind of knowing. Um, my poems are quite short, so if you don't feel like clapping in between, you don't, don't have to. <laughs> but you can. I mean, I won't stop you. <laughs> um, and this one is also a tough renewal, and it's called Incendiary Regret. Looking out across wetlands from the ridge across Tafranui Lush, I was planting, but I am not planted here. It is too easy when I flick a lighter on my own roots to forget I was the one planted in the first place, planted to forget I was the one. When I flick my lighter on my own, it is too easy, but I'm not planted here. I was planting across Tafranui Lush from the ridge, looking across the wetlands. <laughs> It's such a beautiful place. If you ever get a chance to go there, it's a bird sanctuary. It's a beautiful beach. We plant 5,000 native trees, and it's just amazing. What's the, what's the question? Are the tourists? Uh, tourist? Tuatara. No, unfortunately, not there. But um, lots of beautiful native birds and bush. It's just, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, all right, so I'll read a couple more from this, this one, and then um, I have a few of these at the back if anyone would like one. Um, this one is called Poet Blooms. You feel it keenly, and it's an ekphraxis. Ekphraxis? Anyone? Anyone? George? Ek ekphrastic poem <laughs> based on an artwork. So it's, called, it's based on the woodcut called The Flower of Pain by Edvard Munch. <laughs> <laughs> I see you feel it keenly. It could be empathy for a twig snap or a child's bleeding knee pricking you like a thorn. Like wick skin blooming to crimson, excess life is often birthed as the fruit of bursting pain. You feel it keenly. It might be a sense of wonder at snowdrops and all their gaminery, unfolding like a dainty wound somewhere near the left side of your chest. What a privilege it is to feel so keenly. It's all summed up in the bloom of a child's cheeks. Um, Maggie has a had a request as well. Um, she brought my book, which was nice of her. Um, and that one is called After the Pantomime. We will laugh at the transparency of our masks, the pain of wearing them forgotten as we dance open-faced and naked. I know we will, we will marvel at the true audience of our chaos. You will quip about Shakespeare, and I will insist that I never acted a day in my life. <laughs> it's 
so that's that's the um, unfortunately I don't have the real books I've just got booklets today so a little bit cheaper but yeah I've got some the tender moment between strangers um, and I'm sort of working on trying to put a new one together so I'll read you a couple of those I don't know how long I've got so just tell me I just sort of keep going and <laughs> um, I was waiting for the heckle, I was waiting for that one. Usually it's common us. Um, this one's called Emerging Poet. It's dedicated to Jen, um, yeah, Jennifer. So it's called, this is my, I'm called Emerging Poet. <laughs> Who can determine the moment? Is it when she slips from the shower and notices the pearl of soap positioned perfectly in the scalloped dish? His research has returned no conclusions. At Tafranui once, camping, the soon-to-be poet wriggled her toes in her sleeping bag against the cold, words like crumbs itching. To the observer, it could be that this species of poet-to-be will most likely emerge at dawn, shedding blankets with gusto and slowly drawing back the curtains to witness the wattle bird's first poem. Or was it the most... Was it that moment in the heat when she peeled off her cardigan to sit bare-armed on the driveway in a haze of fever dreams? I've seen her in the bath each night with her loofah. Is that the beginning of it? Is the, is the, what should we call her at this stage, sir? Sorry, um, I can't tell the difference. Lately, I note her movement has slowed, so scratching has died down. At 2 a.m. on Wednesday, she was flat and almost lifeless. Does that mean what I think it does? In late March, the scientist attended a conference on metamorphosis Morphosis, but something was bugging him. My subject still hasn't emerged with those paper wings. She should have a set right now. I should be handing them round at readings. A whisper. The other day she swam for hours and built sandcastles. I don't understand it. Shh, they're here. On the stage, a line of poets with their tired paper wings parading and stretching before them. The unnamed woman cocooned against the winter wind and a tartan coat turned and left the state library, a pearl of soap in her pocket pressed between the pages of her secret wings of paper. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if people understand that, but <laughs> come and talk to me about it after. Um, this one is called Women in the Floral Pajamas and it's based <laughs> it's based um, on some like uh, conversation about an, an artwork so I've taken some of the text and reappropriated it. It is a masterpiece of the postmodern era here. The artist depicts a standing figure as a dreamlike vision of fragile femininity and marginalisation. He achieves this effect through the application of several layers of wash and superimposed contours and soft shades of pink and, dare I say, black. Unlike many other figures of the period, the artist has avoided idealised treatment of the facial features. Her informal pose, along with the loose-fitting pyjamas, give the figure an air of couldn't give a fuck, but this would be misleading, as you will see in a moment. <clears throat> The muted colour scheme adds a pensive tone, but there's something deeper here. We may never know the true identity of the subject, but the artist fused the features of different people into a, into a portrait. It's, remarkable, it's a remarkable and striking composition, masterful in its tenderness and arresting in its context outside a suburban shopping mall. The questions it raises in the mind of the viewer, but it is the eyes that continue to speak to us today. Let's take a moment to study the eyes. It's as if you can feel the resignation. <clears throat> the eyes have it. Thank you, Mr. Wise Guy. <laughs> I'm really interested, because in, I write fiction, I'm quite interested in the, the kind of the intersections with fiction and poetics. So, um, Kerry's not here, so. <laughs> Um, she's been telling me that I'm too narrative, but I don't care. <laughs> this one's called Hungry Jack's Sated Poet. At Hungry Jack's, Thomas is reading poetry about basilicas. With his free hand, he is devouring a large hash brown cheeseburger combo. He wants to find the most impenetrable poems and decipher them using Google, but he is distracted by the Chinese girl in her fur-topped boots. Beyond her, through the window, is a hive of students, hump-packed, the traffic drones. The caramel sundae is cold, the topping sparse. He scrapes endlessly at the plastic, ignoring golden trails down his coat front. 
A man with fistfuls of fries obstructs his window vista, so he turns his attention to matters at hand, the last syrupy drops of coke on his tongue, a liquid poem. <laughs> this is for the Kiwis, um, Ode to the Pacific. How does something so magnificent go so unnoticed? This Pacific Ocean stretch sings its lilting wire to the sun. While well, I march to an unending cacophony of the city's brazen beats, voices blaring, sirens competing for their solos, no one stops to hear the ceaseless footfall of the ever-faithful tide against the creak and thud of the nine-to-five stairway to who knows where. This mystery Pacific hums a majestic hymn to the wind, barely audible above the roar and surge of the oncoming traffic. How does something so magnificent wake and sleep without ode to its meekness? It shimmers against the greyest day when I can't see past the sepia drudgery of my mundane waking. It is the humble backdrop to a stunning array of characters who blaze across these pallid city sidewalks with hurried eyes and caffeinated veins. It is the rhythm and pulse of the seasons that gives this claret sweet blood its tempo. But no one stops to watch this perilous love-hate tango of waves in a storm beyond the pixelated projections blaring curtains drawn. But today, I will nestle my feet in the wet sand and sing you an ode. My beautiful Pacific. <laughs> a smart lass. There's a goddess in blue tartan, a, a goddess in blue savers tartan, <laughs> outside the Mechanics Institute. The name brings to mind men and their machines back when sexism was still rife. That's a joke. She's reading a real book. God, that tickles my inner workings. God, Sydney Road is full of babes. Is that infantilizing? Because I'm dreaming of swaddling this one in my arms to keep her warm in the freezer aisle at Aldi. She's not of my clan. Aberdeen ancestors watch with bated breath. Go get her, lassie. I bet she's not reading Robbie Burns. God help me if she's reading engineering textbooks. By the half-light of a rolly, she's reciting poetry while the dapper boys on fixies hurtle past the brunny. This honey with the flax and locks doesn't get a look in, keeps that porcelain under tight wraps. Doesn't it grind your gears when you have to queue at town hall kebabs? No, because I'm waiting for a non-existent bus to Westgarth just so I can get a look in. If she asks me for a light, I will say nothing, but I'll set her on fire just the same, two brains inflamed with enough smarts to ignite every street lamp from here to darkest Coburg. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one's called Consoling a Suicidal Comedian. It's based on a true story. His trembling hands are a giveaway. He grips the mic. His life depends on coins tossed with nonchalance. There are no notes for this rough sea of disapproving faces. I dab his forehead with a flannel during his night sweats. He imagines feedback, screaming. When nerves get the better of him, he resorts to humour, wraps the curtain around himself like Lawrence Bloody Arabia. Silence is his biggest fear, evidence of another bomb. Dead air is the worst, humorless nightmare, raises the heckles. That was before he joined the company. Turns out he loves misery. Easier to engender sympathy. Funny that. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got, like... My poems are really short, so I'm just like, boom, boom, boom. But, um, have I got more time? One more? Two, one or two more? Okay, just two little ones. Um, this one, <laughs> this one's called Why Teenage Girls Giggle. <laughs> it's not as if they are invisible, not like the blank woman three seats back on this packed tram. No one is dying, though, and there is the least need for a banshee's shriek or a witch's cackle. Speaking of which, I feel my blood pressure rise as if by magic. In unkinder times, there would be cries, hysteria, hysteria. Back when they thought women's semen could turn venomous if held within. There's enough evidence of this venom here amongst the hissing tangle of bodies in the stairwell, but they are shapeshifters. As we cross the bridge over the river, their long hair flowing, intermingling, seething before my tired eyes. How quickly I've forgotten my teenage body when the two waters met in cruel confluence, the nearly adult and the child still alive enough to bubble and churn. 
You are listening to 3CR Spoken Word and a live recording of Anna Forso. As I previously mentioned, Anna performs music as well as poetry under the name Grace Pageant, so let's have a listen to the title track of her EP, Little Bonfire. chill in the air tonight I'll wait for you by the fire got a little flame that's blue and bright and warm hands and warm hearts a girl with no bones, she never picked a fight. 
just didn't seem right to her in light of her softness. The people round her told her grow was fine. She said, I'm fine, you know, it's never that simple. Oh, oh, oh. Girl with No Bones off the Little Bonfire EP. And now for the second set of Anna Forsyth. We have a special guest joining me for this poem. Um, please welcome David Attenborough to join me for this one. Hey, yes. A.K.A. Shane. Uh, this poem is called um, David. Uh, Alex is in Love with David. For Alex, Tuesday night became a long, winding tunnel. The podcast, Attenborough in Paradise, had her thinking, the sour smell of sweat. Now I'm leaving the dark world of the forest. Alex was still in the dark forest. She was on a train that was travelling through one in slow motion. She had time to capture still frames in her mind. What first drew me to the bear? One in particular really caught my interest. I met her when she was just a cub 13 years ago. It's great to see her after all this time, but does she remember me? I certainly remember her. And so on. Alex was tossing and turning in between yawns. She stretched her body out as long as she could under the feather doona. David's voice. A raffishly handsome insect with long, elegant legs and a glossy black and scarlet body. The sound of rain, sleep evaded her. By morning, Alex was exhausted. Exhausted. David is from another planet. Does he even sleep? Does he hug orangutans in his dreams in Borneo or Indonesia? The room is a stage set, just a nondescript chair and a table, a poster of an orangutan on the wall. Save the orangutans. Alex is enjoying her marmite jaffle when she hears David's key in the door, badly written script. David addresses the audience. In all my years of exploration, these are the creatures I find most curious. And off she goes so sweetly, (laughs) gently but flamboyantly launching the oversized walnut down the frozen river. Alex enters stage right. Pontificating. That's the word for it. I'm a city girl, he should know that. I would tree plant in gumboots to impress him, but he'd be off. The river gently frisking in the foreground. Watch (laughs) it. 
Watch as the alpha female displays her dominance over the herd by tapping the end of the frisking broom to check for rogue insects. Sigh. Alex drifts in and out on the tide of sleep. I've collected electric catfish. They grow very big indeed. And if you were silly enough to put both hands on one, you'd be thrown flat on your back. Ants arrive. Enjoy the feeding frenzy. Marrow fat doesn't sound tremendously appetizing, but it is hugely nutritious. Interviewer, when you, when you see this sort of stuff, do you get a sense of God's pattern? When you go into your own backyard, are you thinking, oh, there's something? It took me three days to get to Sierra Leone, which is that bulge on the left-hand side of Africa. Dinner conversation. Sigh, sigh, mistaking the guests for seasoned travellers, people who care. There's a sweet drink in South America which is made by old ladies chewing cassava and spitting it into a large pot and letting it ferment for three or four days, after which it tastes exactly like something not sweet but not sour. It smells exactly like vomit. Oh, for f***'s sake, David. Alex wakes in a cold sweat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is actually kind of a fiction piece. It's called Billow, and it's about Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Billow. Tabitha waits blindly for the Holy Spirit from her back porch, sheets billowing their warning. Everything is on the line, damp patches spreading. She notices the slight swell of purple and green fabric, clucks her tongue in recognition of the baby, the king cake, inside. I move her hand so she can see through her fingers, a low moan amongst the trees. He's here, Nana, he's here. But it is a girl's name that she will call out. While they screamed. The men were fishing down at the lake. Josiah, always dutiful, lagged behind. He was trying not to look, but he would always remember the dark slug of guts in the bucket and the way they spilt. Ash Wednesday. The men were still fat from Tuesday, still full, full of a different spirit. I am the dutiful one now. It is my turn to cluck my tongue. I let the baby wail for each of us. Another bucket, another low moan, another wind that chills the guts. But it warms me to think of Tabitha, a sail billowing in the distance, a heart swelling proudly towards the music of the horns, towards the Holy Spirit. Yes. 3CR Spoken Word is on every Thursday morning from 9 o'clock till 9.30, 8.55 on the AM dial and web streamed on www.3cr.org.au. We also do podcasts. So until next time, this is George O'Hara for 3CR Spoken Word.